What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. In today's video, I decided to finally give the people what they've been asking for, and I put together some pre-draft rookie running back rankings. So today is part one of a two-part video in which I will be diving into my pre-draft running back rankings. And basically what this list is, I will not have a list of running backs based on where I would select them in rookie drafts until after the NFL draft. Okay, fuck. The cat is driving me nuts. I'm going to bring the cat in. Okay, this is uh, this is Boris. You can find him on Instagram at your bro Boris. Anyway, post NFL draft, I will have running back rankings that are listed in order of like, I would take this guy in a rookie draft in this order. Right now, this ranking will be, this is the order in which I would take these players if I was like an NFL team, basically. Like, this is just like pure talent. I'm evaluating players. This is how I would rank them, not necessarily how I would take them in a rookie draft if I was drafting today. So let's dive into it. <laughs> I have 42 running backs in this rookie class that I have evaluated so far, and my ranking from 42 to 31 is not really ranked. It's just kind of an alphabetical list of guys I've looked into and basically am not interested in. Some of them are fast, some of them are not, you know, productive, you know, whatever it is, I'm just not looking out for these guys in rookie drafts. Don't think they're that good at all. And they are Raheem Blackshear, Greg Bell, Snoop Connor, Jay Sean Corbin, Cameron Harris, Tyrion Davis Price, Tristan Ebner, Quay Holmes, Isaiah Pacheco, Devontae Price, Master Teague, and CJ Verdell. Um, so some of those guys, you know, they're interesting to like varying degrees. I'm not taking them in rookie drafts right now. Starting at 30, this is a pretty large tier of basically guys who are interesting, but like I'm not quite sure that they're actually good. So, you know, at the very end of a rookie draft, you know, on waivers, whatever, I might be taking a shot on these guys if I'm in like a super deep league, depending on draft capital, things like that. But generally, I'm not positive they're good, even though they're like at least somewhat interesting. And basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you the rank, the player, um, I'm going to give you like two key numbers that will kind of basically as a way to keep me from just like rambling on and making this video like an hour long video, two key numbers to hone in on for their evaluation. And then two comps that kind of represent like sort of a range of outcomes, like a continuum um, that they exist on somewhere. It's not necessarily like a 50, 50 coin flip. Like he could either be this guy or this guy. Some of the range of outcomes are like really tight. Some of them are really wide. These are just like two players within this player's range of outcomes that kind of give you a sense of like how I view them. Anyway, my RB30 in the 2022 running back class is Sincere McCormick out of UTSA. The first number to kind of anchor our evaluation of him is the number one, which is he broke out in year one at UTSA um, as a 19-year-old true freshman, and he posted a 66th percentile, at least a 66th percentile dominator rating every year he played. So he was very productive at a small school from the moment he stepped on campus. The second number is 0 0.20, and that represents his 45th percentile missed tackles forced per attempt mark. And kind of the comps that I have for Sincere McCormick are Devin Singletary on the high end, and then a guy like Jawan Jamison on the low end, who was 5'7", 203, ran a 4'6", 8", played at Rutgers, was another, you know, one of these, you know, Rutgers is a, is a power five school, but it's a, you know, small program. It's not a major program. Um, so he's a smaller guy, um, not athletic, just like McCormick, just like Devin Singletary. He was also productive, but like Devin Singletary, just like Sincere McCormick, was not, he was a decent pass catcher, not great. He was a small guy, not athletic. Neither of them have been very efficient relative to their teammates in college. Singletary especially wasn't that. But Singletary coming out had an 85th percentile tackle breaking, 85th percentile missed tackles forced per attempt. So if he's the guy that we're looking to for like McCormick could be this guy in the NFL, McCormick is not near the tackle breaker that that guy is. So even if a team saw Singletary, recognized that he wasn't efficient, wasn't a great pass catcher, they could say, okay, but he can make things happen because he can break tackles, escape defenders at the line of scrimmage and make things happen that way. McCormick doesn't have that same skill set. He's 5'8", 205, 4'6", in the 40. His box adjusted efficiency rating, just 30th percentile. Relative success rate, just 24th percentile. He just hasn't been that good of a player on like a microscope level despite being productive at a small school. My RB29 in this class 
is Jalen Warren, and the first number for him is 46.6%, which is a 95th percentile dominator rating in his year four season at Oklahoma State, which he posted that a year after Chuba Hubbard posted like a 30% dominator rating in his final season under the same coaching staff at the same school. So he came in and immediately was better than Chuba Hubbard was the year before. But the second number is 96.6, which is Jalen Warren's 51st percentile speed score. He ran a 4.55 at 207 pounds. He had a 43rd percentile burst score, 32nd percentile agility score. He's just not a great athlete. And he also was sort of, you know, not great as a runner um, either. He was a big play guy. He had an 80th percentile breakaway conversion rate, which is pretty good, but just a 42nd percentile relative success rate. So he was creating big plays, but on a play-to-play basis, he was not consistent relative to the other guys at Oklahoma State, not consistent relative to other like high-end running back prospects. And so if his thing is creating big plays, does he have the athleticism to do that in the NFL? Given his, you know, his 40-yard dash, given his burst and agility numbers, I don't know that he has that. And so the comps I have for him are Khalil Herbert, who's been really efficient for the Bears in a number two role, and then Jalen Moore, who came out of, um, I don't remember if it was Appalachian State, I think it was Appalachian State a couple years ago, you know, similarly sized, just hasn't been much in the NFL. Um, So that's my RB29. RB28 for me in this class is Ty Chandler. And the first number to keep in mind for him is 438. He's got 98th percentile speed. That's 438 in the 40-yard dash. But the thing with that is it hasn't really translated to the field. His breakaway conversion rate, which measures how often is he turning 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs, you know, runs of 20 yards or more. So kind of measuring what he's doing in the open field, where you would think that high-end speed would translate to a lot of big plays. His breakaway conversion rate is only in the 49th percentile, so slightly below average. And he hasn't been efficient relative to his teammates, just a 36th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, and he doesn't break tackles, 29th percentile there. And the second number I want to keep in mind for Ty Chandler is 2.86, which is his pounds per inch, which is basically just BMI. So that's the same thing for Patrick Laird and Theo Riddick. To make an impact in the NFL, he's probably going to either A, have to be drafted by the 49ers because they don't give a fuck about anything other than speed. They take these skinny dudes who don't catch passes and turn them into, you know, seven yards per carry guys every single year. But if he doesn't get drafted by the 49ers, he's going to have to be a great pass catcher. I think he's decent there. I don't know that he's great. I don't think he's a very good runner. So my comps for him are Ty Johnson, another, you know, straight line speed guy, and Darrell Scott, who was kind of that same thing, but didn't experience much NFL success. My RB27 in this class is Ronnie Rivers out of Fresno State, and the first number to keep in mind for him is 150. That is uh, his career receptions totals, the second most in this class behind only Max Borgie, and the third most on a per game basis behind only Max Borgie and Kyron Williams. And he was fairly efficient there as well. His yards per target number is in the 65th percentile, and he was a decent runner as well. 58th percentile in box adjusted efficiency rating, so above average efficiency both on the ground and through the air. But the second number, and really maybe the most important one for Ronnie Rivers is five, and that's how many years he spent in college. And at Fresno State, he did post three straight seasons with a dominant with a dominator rating above the 70th percentile, but the NFL just wasn't interested. If that's what he's doing at a small school and, you know, the selection committee or whoever the fuck it is that, like, examines these college players and advises them to, like, either go back to school or de- or declare for the draft, they looked at that production. They looked at what he was doing on the field and apparently never gave him an indication, at least one that he acted on, that said, you're ready, declare for the NFL. That never happened. He was able to spend five years in school because of the extra COVID year. This last year, he posted, like, his worst dominator rating since he was a freshman, just like 19%. The NFL just hasn't been interested in him, and I think he was a decent college player and his comps that I have for him are like Edo Smith on the high end and CJ Marable out of Coastal Carolina on the low end. Fairly like narrow range of outcomes with Edo Smith being like a decent contributor. I don't think that the ceiling is very high for Ronnie Rivers, but I do think in a vacuum, he's a solid player. My RB26 in this class pre-draft is Jerry and Ely out of Ole Miss. And the first number for him is 0.32, which is his missed tackles forced per attempt number, which is in the 97th percentile. So he is one of these dudes, he's small, he's like 189 pounds, but he is shifty as fuck. The thing is, it didn't really result in on-field efficiency, though. 35th percentile in box-adjusted efficiency rating. And the second number to keep in mind for him is 5. He was a 5-star prospect coming out a couple years ago. Two-sport athlete. He could be a professional baseball player if he wanted. But he hasn't really made good on that pedigree. His best dominator rating he ever posted was 19.5%. That's just in the 51st percentile. And he's played with running backs like Snoop Connor was the best other running back at Ole Miss this last season. 
season. So it's not like there's a bunch of studs keeping him from getting on the field like, you know, like there would be at like Georgia or something like that. As a five-star prospect, you want to see this guy just dominate his, you know, his offense, dominate his, his backfield. And he just hasn't done that. He's been relatively efficient as a pass catcher, 64th percentile yards per target, but that's really not that good. Like he's a tackle breaker with a lot of like hypothetical talent, but I think we're just kind of hoping for something that we haven't seen yet. And my range of outcomes for him is Justice Hill, who's just kind of a decent, you know, athlete for the Ravens, and Tyler Irvin, who basically, you know, kind of bounced around for a little bit and then was used as like a jet sweep guy for the Packers a couple of years ago. So not hoping for much from Jerry and Ely, but I think he does have talent. Uh, my RB25 in this class is Kyron Williams. And the first number to keep in mind for him is 30.5%. And that is the 72nd percentile dominator rating that he posted on a Notre Dame team last year that was top 10 in the country. The year before that, he posted a 76th percentile dominator rating on a Notre Dame team that was top five in the country. So he's been really productive, a really productive lead back for really good teams the past two seasons. But the second number to keep in mind for him is 194, which is how much he weighed at the combine. He came in very small. He ran 4.65. We know he's not a good athlete. And he hasn't been good like on a per touch basis on the field. Only 55th percentile yards per target. And that's like his thing. He's a pass catching back, but he hasn't really even been that good there despite being productive. And on the ground, he's been really bad. 26th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, 37th percentile relative success rate. The range of outcome comps I have for him are Theo Riddick and James Williams. Theo Riddick was another guy from Notre Dame who was a pass catching back, uh, not very big, not very athletic, but ended up like sticking around in the NFL as, you know, a pretty productive satellite guy. And then James Williams, who came out of uh, Washington State a couple years ago, looked like the next, you know, satellite back that was going to make some noise in the NFL and just literally didn't do anything. I would not be shocked to see Kyron Williams end up as either one of those guys in the NFL. My RB24 in this class is Jerome Ford out of Cincinnati by way of Alabama. And the first number to keep in mind for him is 36.7%, which was his breakaway conversion rate in college. It's a 76th percentile number. And his 44640 kind of backs that up. He's good in the open field. He's fast. He's an explosive player. But the other side of that is the second number to keep in mind for him is negative 5.2%, which is his relative success rate, which indicates how often is he succeeding on a play-to-play basis relative to his teammates. And given the box counts he's seeing, it's just a 12th percentile number. He's succeeding on 5% fewer of his runs than the other guys on his team are. And so despite being really good in the open field, given that he's not consistent on a play-to-play basis, Basis, his overall efficiency results in just a 54th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating. He's a very volatile runner, boom bust runner, and he's five foot ten and a half and 210 pounds. So he's relatively tall for his slightly undersized weight. And at that, you know, body type, you need to be a good receiver generally to make an impact in the NFL, unless you go to the 49ers. So, you know, if that happens, all bets are off. But he had a, 20th, a 20th percentile target share in college. He was relatively efficient on that light work, but he wasn't used there much. It's hard to say if he's a good receiver or not. The range of outcomes I have for him are Miles Sanders and Darrington Evans. Miles Sanders is a similar guy, athlete, big play guy, used as a receiver, not super confident in his ability as a pass catcher. He's been decent there as a pro. And then Darrington Evans, who similar kind of receiving and rushing profiles is a little bit smaller than both Ford and Sanders. But I think that type of player is the guy that Ford could be in the NFL. I'd lean more towards him being on the Darrington Evans side than the Miles Sanders side. Uh, My RB23 is Max Borgie out of Washington State. The first number to keep in mind for him is 124.4% which is his box-adjusted efficiency rating. So the average Borgie carry was worth 124% the output of all other, you know, an average carry from all other Washington State running backs during his career, which is in the 71st percentile. And he's 207 pounds. Borgie kind of gets put in this bucket with all these other satellite backs like Tyler Beatty and Tyler Goodson and Jerry and Ely in this class. But he's bigger than those dudes. Like he's, you know, he's undersized for running back, but he's closer to being lead back size than a lot of those other guys are. And the second number I want to keep in mind for Max Borgie is 202, which doesn't really have anything to do with Borgie, but that's James Williams' career receptions total while playing at the same school in basically the same offense that Borgie came from. And like I said before, we looked at James Williams coming out, at least I did. I know a lot of people in the fantasy space did and saw, man, this guy was like a dynamic receiver, really heavily used. He could be the next James White. He could be the next Theo Riddick and nothing happened with him. Max Borgie's career receptions totals are 156 in the same offensive system. And so given a guy like James Williams, it's difficult 
to take what Borgie did at face value, both on the ground and through the air, because that offensive system was just so inflated. The air raid there with Mike Leach just created these like wonky numbers for these running backs that makes it hard to know like what is legitimate, what is just a product of the system. And so Borgie's evaluation is very difficult. The range of outcome comps I have for him are Giovanni Bernard and Travion Williams. If these things are legit for Borgie, if we can trust that he's really good on the ground, and if we can trust his prolific receiving numbers and say, okay, yes, he is a legitimately good pass catcher who should be a part of an NFL passing game, he could be Giovanni Bernard, like an undersized, low-key, three-down guy who's going to contribute for a while. And if those things aren't legitimate, he might be Travion Williams, a guy who like seems like he probably should be better should get more playing time than he does, but just like doesn't really put it together and doesn't really turn out to be anything. So my RB 22 in this class is Brian Robinson out of Alabama. The first number I want to think about for him is 5.4%, which is his 75th percentile relative success rate, which indicates that you know, on a consistency basis, just churning out positive yardage, gaining a requisite amount of yards, given down a distance. Brian Robinson's been really good relative to really talented teammates. You know, he's succeeding on 5% more of his runs than other dudes at Alabama. That's really impressive. The other side of that is he just has a 10th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating. So he offers no open field juice. He offers no dynamism. He's getting what is blocked on a consistent basis and not taking negative plays, doing what is needed to navigate the line of scrimmage, but he's not offering anything above and beyond that. He's not been efficient at all relative to his teammates, despite being successful more often than they are. And the second number I want to keep in mind is 7.5% for Brian Robinson, which represents the top dominator rating he posted through four years in college, a sub 10th percentile number. The only time he posted a dominator rating higher than 7.5% was in his fifth season at school. The only reason he had a fifth season at school was because of COVID and That season, last year, he posted a 24.4% dominator rating as the lead back for Alabama in 2021, which itself is still only in the 48th percentile. So my range of outcomes for him is Carlos Hyde and Alexander Madison, which might seem like really high end for RB22. But Carlos Hyde, I think, was not very good. He just kind of got thrown into volume and, you know, did the bare minimum with it in the NFL. And I think Alexander Madison has kind of been the same thing. He hasn't been thrown into volume except for when Dalvin Cook gets hurt, but he does the bare minimum with it. But those guys are both three down players who are pretty jaggy, can do what needs to be done, but aren't offering any like extra value to the offense. And I think that's basically what Brian Robinson is. He will almost certainly be higher in my like post draft rookie draft running back rankings because he's going to get draft capital. But as a pure player, I don't think he's that good. My RB21 in this class is Tyler Beatty out of Missouri. And the first number to keep in mind for him is 44.6%. And that represents the 94th percentile dominator rating that he posted as a senior in 2021 to go along with a target share in the 96th percentile. So very productive as a fourth year guy in the SEC. But the second number to keep in mind for him is 108%, which is a 27th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating. So, you know, I hear a lot of buzz about like people being in on Tyler Beatty is like, you know, the next Austin Eckler, you know, one of these guys, like he's a, you know, he's athletic and he was productive and, you know, he checks those boxes of, you know, speed score and dominator rating and stuff like that as like a potential three down guy satellite back fusion in the NFL. I'm not seeing it because he's not a good runner. He wasn't efficient as a runner in college. He saw incredibly light boxes relative to the other guys at Missouri. So he wasn't being put in like lead back situations. He was running against light fronts. He wasn't doing much with the ball when he was running with it. And he broke out in year four at Missouri. Like the guys he was competing with are like Damari Crockett and you know, whoever the fuck else was there. These aren't good players. And so my range of outcomes for Tyler Beatty is DeAndre Washington. Maybe he can be like a replacement level satellite back type, you know, contributing on an NFL team. The other side of that is Isaiah Peed, who, you know, just didn't ever really do much. Just wasn't, was just kind of a guy. So RB20 is Tyler Goodson. The other, you know, kind of Tyler Beatty and Tyler Goodson are kind of the two main satellite backs, um, other than like James Cook, who I'll get to in probably the next video. But Tyler Goodson at RB20, the first number to keep in mind for him is 10.88, which is his 95th percentile agility score. So he was super dynamic in the agility drills. Um, he had a 77th percentile burst score. He ran 4.42 in the 40 yard dash. He was a super athlete at the combine. And the second number to keep in mind for him is 0.05, which is the relative box counts that he saw versus what the other guys at Iowa saw. And 
this is unique for Goodson because among these satellite back types, you know, among the Kyron Williams and Jerry and Ely, Tyler Beatty type guys in this class, Tyler Goodson is really the only one who saw heavier box counts than the other guys on his team. That relative box count is in the 57th percentile. And so Tyler Bate or Tyler Goodson, while he wasn't very efficient on his carries, 16th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, 15th percentile relative success rate. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt for that because a lot of his carries came in situations that weren't conducive to efficient play. He wasn't doing good things when he got the ball in those situations. But if we look at what he's likely to be in the NFL, which is like a satellite back, he's not going to be running into eight and nine man boxes a lot. And relative to other satellite backs in this class, that's where a lot of his carries came in college. He won't be running against those same heavy fronts in the NFL. The range of outcomes comps for him are Deion Lewis and Ido Smith. So I'm a little bit more confident that Tyler Goodson is going to be a good player relative to guys like Kyron Williams, Ronnie Rivers, and Tyler Beatty. My RB19 in this class is Isaiah Spiller. I believe in my pre-combine rankings, I had him up at like RB9 or RB10 or something like that, which looking back was kind of a cowardly ranking because I was never in an Isaiah Spiller and he was really only there to like, I don't know, like cover my ass and like placate the Isaiah Spiller stands. You know, I put him at RB10, which is way below consensus at the time, but I, I don't think he's the 10th best running back in this class and I didn't think he was before the combine. But the first number I want to keep in mind for him is 18.1 which is his breakout age in the SEC. That's in the 99th percentile. That's really good. He posted three straight 1,000 yard and 20 reception seasons at Texas A&M. But the second number to keep in mind for him is negative 6.3%, which, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about how, you know, I like to evaluate running backs on the ground using their efficiency relative to their teammates because that gives us a window into what they are doing given the context of the offense that, they, that they're playing in. And Isaiah Spiller just looks terrible there. And the common retort to that is, yeah, but Devon A-Chain is on the team and Devon A-Chain is like inflating these efficiency numbers for Spiller's teammates. And so it's not a fair comparison for Spiller relative to other guys in this class who don't have a super talented guy like A-Chain, you know, kind of blowing them out of the water from an efficiency standpoint on their own team. Negative 6.3% is Devon A. Chain's relative success rate from when he was a freshman without Devon A. Chain even on the team. That relative success rate is in the ninth percentile, not good at all. His box-adjusted efficiency rating that season without Devon A. Chain on the team was in the 15th percentile. Isaiah Spiller has never been efficient relative to his teammates in college, even if you remove Devon Achin from the sample, even if you only look at the season in which Devon Achin wasn't on the team. And if you're going to say, okay, but that was his freshman year, he's gotten better since then, then you can't look at his breakout age as a positive if you're going to claim that he wasn't even a good player then. You, you just like can't have it both ways. He was a productive player when he was a freshman. He has never been a good player on a per touch basis, even without comparing him to Devon A. Chain. So that's the, those are the key numbers there. And his best athletic trait is a 55th percentile mark in the short shuttle. He's not fast. He's not explosive. He's not particularly quick laterally. The top comps for him, carry on Johnson and Paul Perkins. Um, this next tier of guys starting at 18 and through RB14 is guys that I'm pretty sure are good. I'm probably legitimately interested in these guys, at least like on waivers after rookie drafts. I don't know that any of them are going to be guys who get like strong draft capital. Actually, a couple of them will just looking here, but these guys aren't in kind of my upper tier of guys I'm, you know, specifically targeting, but I at least think they're good. And my RB18 is Kennedy Brooks. And the first number to keep in mind for him is 3.71, which is the collective average star rating that his teammates had as high school recruits, which is in the 72nd percentile, including guys like Trey Sermon, guys like Ramondre Stevenson. Kennedy Brooks played with and ran out of town some very talented running backs at Oklahoma. In his four seasons, he uh, sat out the COVID year, but he had three like actual seasons. Every single one of them, he ran for 1,000 yards. He posted a 116.5% box adjusted efficiency rating and a 3.5% relative success rate. So relative to those really good teammates and guys who we've seen be successful in the NFL, like Ramondre Stevenson, he A, kept them on the bench, and B, was more efficient than them on a per-touch basis, more consistent than them on a per-touch basis. But the second number to keep in mind for him is 3.8%, and that's his sixth percentile target share. He's absolutely not a pass catcher at this point in his development, and at 5'10 and 5 eighths of an inch and 209 pounds, he's also a little bit undersized. 
also a little bit skinny. It's tough to project him for heavy work in the NFL, given that he's probably not going to be able to play on third downs and doesn't have great size to see high volume work as a rusher. Range of outcomes comps for him are Ronald Jones and Dexter Williams. RB17 in this class is Abram Smith, and the first number for him is 136%, which is his 86th percentile box adjusted efficiency rating, which basically just means Abram Smith was fucking legit as like a ball carrier last season. That box adjusted efficiency rating is great. His relative success rate is in the 65th percentile, also great. His breakaway conversion rate, so what is he doing in the open field? 74th percentile, so he was a big play guy. And he totaled over 1,600 rushing yards at Baylor last year on a good team in the Big 12. The second number to keep in mind for Abram Smith is 56, and that's his career tackles number. He's a converted linebacker who played running back really only his final season, and those 56 tackles would be the second most for any running back drafted since 2007. And that's a good thing in that it gives him some utility on special teams, you know, some multi-positional um, versatility that he can use to provide value to an NFL team and leverage towards like, you know, making it past final cuts, actually making a roster. But it also means that he's probably fairly raw. Like I said, he only played running back for one year. He only has 14 career receptions. And like Kennedy Brooks, he's relatively tall. He almost He's almost six feet tall and he's only 211 pounds. So he also... Is relatively tall and skinny, doesn't catch passes. That's not a good recipe for seeing volume in the NFL. His range of outcomes comps are Jordan Wilkins, a guy who is bigger than this, but who has also been a really efficient runner, unlimited work in the NFL. And then Bruce Anderson, who you remember, I think Matt Waldman loved him a couple years ago, has done nothing in the NFL. My RB16 is Hassan Haskins out of Michigan. And the first number for him is 5.5%, which is his 77th percentile relative success rate. So, you know, kind of just like Brian Robinson, he has been really good relative to some really good teammates at like consistently churning out positive positive yardage, gaining what is needed, given down a distance against, you know, relative to really talented teammates. He ran Zach Charbonnet out of town. Hassan Haskins just kind of stole that job from Charbonnet. This last season at Michigan, he had 1,300 yards and 20 touchdowns. And the second number for him is 0.28, which, you know, kind of going back to Tyler Goodson, that's the relative box count he saw, you know, relative to the other guys at Michigan. It's in the 93rd percentile. The average box count for Hassan Haskins saw almost a third of a defender more than what the other guys at Michigan were seeing. And so he's running into very heavy boxes. And while that's impressive to be efficient against those heavy boxes, it also is a bad sign that he's the kind of player who is running in heavy box situations. His target share was only in the 17th percentile. So he's not a pass catcher. He's 228 pounds. He's purely a two down pounder. And so although I think he's a good runner, the type of player he is, the type of downs he's going to be playing on are not going to be conducive to efficiency in the NFL. And he's a black box athlete. He's been dealing with an ankle injury throughout this offseason process. We have no idea what he runs in the 40. We have no idea what he would do in the agility drills or the jump drills. We just don't know. And range of outcomes comps for him, I forgot to write down, but let me think of them. They would be something like Rashard Mendenhall without receiving chops or Zach Zenner. Let's go with that. So basically a guy who is a two down pounder, doesn't catch the ball. And Chris Carson, maybe Chris Carson might be a good one. Chris Carson and some other random dude who isn't, you know, anything because he can't catch the ball. Uh, my RB15 is Pierre Strong. The first number to keep in mind for Pierre Strong is 437, and that's his 99th percentile speed. He ran 437 in the 40, and he's, you know, a full skill set, like athletic beast, really. 86th percentile burst score, 75th percentile agility score, um, and he rode those athletic traits to yards per carry plus relative to the other guys at South Dakota State in the 72nd percentile, and he ripped off 10 yard runs at a clip greater than the other guys at C South Dakota State as well. Well, his chunk rate plus is in the 71st percentile. The second number to keep in mind for Pierre Strong is 69, and that is the amount of touchdowns scored by South Dakota State last season at the FCS level. They also had 6,619 yards, and that's part of what makes Pierre Strong a difficult evaluation. His best dominator rating he ever posted at the FCS level is 27.9%, which is in the 61st percentile for fifth-year college football running backs. But he, again, he did it as a fifth-year guy, and he did it at an FCS school. And, you know, while they were a super prolific offense, and so it's hard for him to have a large share of that offense, I'm willing to make that concession for a guy who played at, like, Alabama. Like, yeah, Josh Jacobs wasn't, you know, super dominant. You know, he didn't have a super dominant share of Alabama's offense, but it was Alabama. Like, nobody has a super large share of Alabama's offense. Versus, can we make that, you know, can we 
apply that same caveat for a guy who played, you know, not even at the FBS level. And so that makes Pierre Strong's evaluation really difficult. And his range of outcomes comps for me are David Wilson, um, you know, super dynamic guy for the Giants a while ago, who um, I think was ended up being like an Olympic triple jumper or something because he got hurt in the NFL. But he was a super dynamic, um, you know, kind of full skill set guy, a little bit undersized. Pierre Strong's like 207, 203 pounds, something like that. And the other end of the range of outcomes is Anthony McFarland out of uh, Maryland, who is kind of a similar guy, super explosive, hasn't really done anything with Pittsburgh. He's just not quite good enough as a receiver, given his size to like really get on the field and be able to like show what he can do. My RB14 in this class, and the last guy I'm going to talk about in this video is Zonovan Knight. The first number to keep in mind for him is 4.07, which is his 95th percentile performance in the short shuttle. He, you know, was able to leverage that into an 89th percentile agility score, and he uses that lateral quickness to break tackles at a 94th percentile rate on a per-touch basis, and he was really efficient on his touches relative to some decent running backs at, N at NC State, 77th percentile box-adjusted efficiency rating without creating big plays. His breakaway conversion rate just in the 23rd percentile. So he's not one of these Jerome Ford guys who isn't consistent on a down-to-down -down basis and is only efficient because he creates big plays. Zonovan Knight is legitimately efficient without needing these splash plays to, like, inflate his numbers. The second number I want to keep in mind for him, though, is 5.2, which is his yards per target number, and it's just in the 25th percentile. He had a 27th percentile target share, 38th percentile catch rate, and similar to guys like Kennedy Brooks and Abram Smith, he's 5'11", 209, a little undersized, a little skinny, especially given that he doesn't catch passes. I think he's one of the best peer runners in this class, and so his range of outcomes comps are Sony Michelle and Jamar Jefferson. That's going to do it for part one of my pre-draft running back rankings. Uh, should have RB13 through RB1 in a video coming, I believe, on Wednesday, so stay tuned for that. Let me know how dumb I am in the comments for having Isaiah Spiller at RB19, and peace. <laughs>